Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here during this Facebook Live. My name is Luke Margolis. I'm the Corporate Communications Director for Atlantic Health System. And joining me today is Dr. Jason Kessler. He's the Section Chief of Infectious Diseases at Atlantic Health System's Morristown Medical Center. Doctor, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to give folks another couple of minutes uh, to join our discussion, to get uh, signed on and logged into our, our uh, Facebook Live session here. Um, so while we do that, I want to thank everybody who took a couple moments to uh, join us for the last Facebook Live we did last Tuesday. Brian Granulati, our president and CEO, joined us. More than 25,000 people uh, took some time to watch that Facebook Live, and they submitted um, so many questions that were so great. So thank you to everybody who did that. Um, and a lot of those questions, doctor, were clinical in nature. And so rather than um, throw them to Brian, we thought you might be able to come on and provide us with some thoughts. So as uh, folks are joining the group here, uh, I want to welcome them. We had more than 100 questions submitted for this. So clearly you're a popular guy. And, um, and thank you for joining us today and doing this. Well, my pleasure. I'm uh, very happy to hear that there's so much community engagement around COVID-19 and our response to it. And uh, I'll just take a brief moment just to thank everyone who's working on the front lines. I mean, I see it every day, the resiliency, the determination, and the compassion that our uh, medical staff, especially our nurses, are providing to our patients every day, the first responders, the people who are working on the front lines in essential jobs like our grocery store clerks, our gas station attendants, the people that aren't getting the recognition that maybe the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers are. We really appreciate all their work. They are essential as well. Thank you for saying that. Um, so again, a shout out to everybody across our system too who is watching. Uh, of course, we mentioned Morristown Medical Center, but also Overlook Medical Center, Chilton Medical Center, Newton Medical Center, and Hackettstown Medical Center. Thank you all so much for uh, taking a second out of your day today to join us for this conversation as well. So as we mentioned, um, the, the focus of today's conversation is um, how people can avoid COVID-19 um, or coronavirus is uh, another way to refer to it. So Let's start first with some broad strokes. And one of the questions we got, which I think is really important to address off the top, is that this is, in fact, a novel coronavirus. We are very much um, uh, only several months into learning about the existence of this. Uh, and so one of the questions we got was, how can you have a discussion about this when we don't know everything there is to know about this yet? Where are we in this process of learning about this virus? And, and how much do we really know at this point? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, we don't know everything that we need to know. And, and that does uh, hamper some of our response. Uh, and it makes things more challenging as far as diagnosis, and as far as treatment, and as far as prevention are concerned. But the good news is we've learned a tremendous amount in the last three to six months. Um, we do know that there have been other novel coronaviruses that cause illness very similar to uh, COVID-19, uh, most specifically, SARS and MERS, which are two other coronaviruses that caused significant outbreaks and still cause disease to this day, at least in the case of MERS. So we do have some experience with novel coronaviruses causing diseases in humans. Uh, and over the last three, three to four months, we've learned a tremendous amount about how people contract uh, the coronavirus, novel coronavirus. We've learned a tremendous amount how it's transmitted uh, to, from person to person. Uh, and we're learning more every day about the best ways to mitigate uh, the disease, the best ways to prevent the spread from person to person, uh, and the best ways that we can treat those individuals who are unfortunate enough to have contracted the illness. So yes, there's more to learn, and we will continue to learn uh, and make mistakes. But uh, we have learned a tremendous amount. And if you just go on some of the medical literature websites, if you look on PubMed, which is sort of the database that houses all uh, references to uh, medicine and to science that's related to medicine, you can see a dramatic exponential increase in the number of publications that are related to COVID-19, uh, its treatment, its prevention, uh, its transmission. Uh, and so we learn more every day, uh, and our response will become even uh, more uh, directed uh, and targeted and precise as the days and months uh, go on. You mentioned um, the, the number of folks that we're caring for throughout this process. And, and in recent days, um, both on the New York side of the Hudson River and on the New Jersey side as well, we've heard a lot of talk about this concept of reaching this peak 
in cases, and whether or not this is a peak that then dips down, or if it's more of a plateau and stretches out. Um, for the folks who are watching who may not have much of an epidemiological background, can you describe what this concept of a plateau is and what it means in relation to the growth of new COVID-19 cases? So I think, as people have probably heard in the news uh, or on social media, we've entered a phase of mitigation, so to speak, which really means trying to minimize the amount of harm that's being done to our communities, to our uh, population, uh, and as much as possible to our economy. Um, if we had not entered into this phase, what we would have likely seen was a very large spike in cases, uh, much, much greater than what we've seen to date. Uh, but through our mitigation strategies, our flattening the curve strategy, so to speak, we, instead of a very rapid peak upward, we've seen a much slower climb in the number of cases, which may result in a sort of larger plateau or a flattening phase of the uh, epidemic. The reason that's so important is because our healthcare system has a particular capacity. We only have so many doctors. We it's only not have infinite. Yeah. It's not infinite. We don't have infinite number of nurses. We don't have an infinite number of ventilators. Uh, we don't have an infinite supply of personal protective equipment. So there is a capacity that we can reach. Uh, and by flattening this curve, making it uh, sort of look longer over or spread it out over a longer period of time, but not have the magnitude reach a sort of a very high peak, we can ensure that people who become sick will have adequate uh, health care, will have adequate uh, medication, will have adequate health care workers, uh, and the health care workforce will remain healthy enough to care for these patients, and will have adequate supply of personal protective equipment for those health care workers. So that really is the importance of why uh, flattening the curve is a critical um, uh, goal over the next several weeks. So uh, traditionally, uh, the way we approach these is I prepare a number of questions and, uh, and then I, I pass them or I, I ask them of, of, of our guest. But in this instance, we received so many from folks who are curious with their own uh, questions about how they're experiencing it, how, how COVID-19 is affecting their personal daily lives. And, and we thought this is just a tremendous opportunity to have a person with your background and expertise um, address some of those for the folks watching. So I'm going to kind of put my stuff aside and we can come back to it if we need to later on. But we'll get to some of the questions um, from our community, if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, and we tried to bucket them, which you may remember from our last conversation. There's some similarity throughout. So while you're you may be sitting at home saying, hey, that was my question. Um, a lot of people had the exact same question, so we bucketed them as best we can, and so we had, we're trying to ask ones that are representative of the whole. So uh, we appreciate everybody who submitted them. But let's start first with one that appeared in a number of ways, um, and that has to do with folks who have relatives who are living in, an assist in assisted living facilities. Um, there is a, a, a lot of concern about what guidance we should be providing or they should be providing to their relatives who live there, um, whether or not they can go visit those folks. Um, should they be telling folks within those facilities to avoid certain common areas? In the main, what would your best advice be for folks who have relatives in assisted living facilities right now? So uh, unfortunately, uh, assisted living facilities house some of our most vulnerable uh, community members, the elderly or the otherwise infirm. Fortunately, there have recently been guidance issued by the Centers for Disease Control as well as the New Jersey Department of Health as to steps that long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, and nursing homes can take to mitigate uh, the impact that COVID-19 has on their facilities. We've already seen dramatic impacts across the country, however, uh, that this disease has taken on these facilities. From a perspective of a relative who has a loved one in one of these facilities, each of these facilities is developing their own uh, infection prevention plan and strategy uh, to combat COVID-19. The best advice that I have for uh, loved ones who have their parents or their grandparents even in one of these facilities is to reach out and talk to the folks, the leaders at these facilities. They can give you operating guidance, the, the operating facilities. Mm -hmm. They can give you the guidance as to what their plan is all about, what they're doing, the steps that they're taking. Most of these facilities are practicing some sort of reverse isolation, meaning they're not allowing visitors into the facility. And while that creates a lot of anxiety, I would imagine, for, for relatives, mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think it is needed because we know that there are a tremendous number of people who can be either asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatically infected with, with uh, novel coronavirus or have very, very minimal symptoms, so minimal that they may not even attribute them to, a, uh, to an infection like novel coronavirus. They may think they have an allergy to whatever is going around or something like that. So for a number of reasons, uh, I think it is good practice that a number of these facilities are restricting visitors. Uh, and that's probably the, uh, one of the reasons why, to try to protect these very vulnerable people. One of the things I forgot to mention about our setup here, um, in terms of think responsible things we can do, of course, revolves around social distancing, which you uh, referenced in your previous answer. This table is actually uh, six feet apart. So this is us sort of practicing what we preach here as we, as we uh, produce these Facebook Lives. So um, it's a good example of six feet. You can still engage in conversations with folks and, and do the right thing and, and to do it in a way that's sa uh, safer uh, for everyone. So that's uh, a reference there as to how we're set up here. Um, question regarding um, is a little bit of where we go from here. Um, we had some folks who were wondering all the advances we've made in biotechnology, um, pharmaceuticals, the advancement of science. Why does creating a vaccine for, for a virus like this take so long? We've heard 18 months in some estimates, um, at least that's what we were hearing last month. Why, why does it take so long to come up with something like that for this? Well, I mean, I think it takes, it takes a long time from the perspective of, uh, I guess, the community, uh, because the immunity to any germ, whether it be a virus or a bacteria or uh, a parasite is a very complex phenomenon. We don't, uh, our bodies don't attack these germs in the same way. Uh, they use different strategies and different tools uh, to combat these uh, germs and prevent infection or treat or fight off the infection once we are infected. And so first we have to learn a lot about what the particular germ is. We have to learn its structure. We have to learn how it behaves uh, in our bodies, which is part of the process of what's been going on in the last several months. And then we have to learn a lot about how our body fights off the germ naturally. So in the case of uh, a novel coronavirus, we, we're learning more each day as to how our immune system uh, attacks this virus once it, it gets inside of us uh, and how people recover from the infection once it is inside of them. Uh, so there's a lot of learning that needs to be done, first of all, so that we can create an effective vaccine. Uh, following that, we have to test the vaccine because we don't want to develop something that could be unsafe or cause more harm uh, than benefit. And we know this from other uh, vaccine development um, strategies that have been undertaken for other diseases like SARS or something like uh, respiratory syncytial virus or other viruses or other infections that sometimes uh, we can treat or give somebody a vaccine and it can actually do more harm than good. It can cause an infection to become worse if you should uh, get infected with the natural, the natural form of the disease. Uh, and so a lot of careful investigation needs to be done to create the vaccine. And then there's a lot of work after that to test the vaccine to make sure that A, most importantly, it's safe, and then B, that it's effective. And then once all that work has been done, then we've got to figure out the logistics of ramping up production so that we can deliver it to you know, 350 million people potentially in our country. Forget about the 8 billion people that exist around the world. So the logistical, technical, and scientific challenges are immense, um, but it's proceeding at a rate that is much, much faster than ever before. And the so, same, same science then would apply to treatments as well, whether you, know, you don't necessarily want to prescribe something for somebody that potentially could have unknown side effects and things along those lines. Exactly. Well. And we're learning more about treatment every single day in our own clinical experience, but also about what's being done in other parts of the world. And so one of the biggest frustrations for physicians on the front line, and I would imagine for any healthcare worker on the front line, is the, the lack of uh, known therapies that are effective against this virus and against this disease. We work diligently every day to try and uh, figure out what is working uh, and what does work. And we've, you know, we're working in our hospital and acro hospitals across the world mm -hmm. on figuring out strategies to mitigate the effect of the disease. Uh, but as of yet, you know, we don't have a, a fallback antiviral treatment that we can use 
for uh, COVID-19. And with that, it's, uh, I think, a valuable time to recognize all of our physicians, both um, as part of Atlantic Medical Group and all the physicians here at Atlantic Health System who are going um, above and beyond in every way they can to help our patients. So thank you for all that you do, and, 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 um, and thank you, Dr. Kessler, for all that you're doing as well. Um, we have a number of questions that um, uh, involve additional care that people may be seeking, um, one of which that was a common theme is expectant folks, uh, moms who are expecting to deliver soon. Uh, we, we have one question from Allison, who we thank for uh, submitting this. Um, she says she's due to deliver her first child any day at Morristown Medical Center and is curious what she can do, can, um, to, to, what she and her husband can do to protect their newborn from contracting COVID-19, things the hospital is doing. What are, at that level for, for, for babies, expectant moms, what, what type of guidance would you provide? I know that um, yeah. obstetrics is not necessarily your specialty, but what, what type of guidance would you provide? For I mean, I think we have to recognize that uh, in many different infections, pregnancy is a risk factor for more severe complications. We don't know yet uh, with certainty, but the effects of pregnancy on COVID-19 and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we believe that there's very little likelihood of direct transmission of the virus from mom to baby while in utero or while the baby's still in the uterus. Uh, and there is probably uh, somewhat increased risk once the baby is uh, born and the, is being cared for by the mother. Uh, or the father for that matter. Sure. Uh, so there is a risk of horizontal transmission from mom to baby or dad to baby. Okay. Um, but that being said, I think what we advise our pregnant moms and the, their spouses or their significant partners to do before the pregnancy is really continue doing what everyone else is doing, which right. is maintaining social distancing practices uh, as best you can. So trying to limit the opportunity to become infected with this virus is first and foremost the most important step that you can take leading up to the laboring process. Uh, washing your hands regularly if you're venturing out of your own home or if you're handling uh, items that you're not sure of what the source may be. Mm -hmm. Those um, recommendations still hold true if you're pregnant, if you're not pregnant, if you're the spouse or significant partner of a pregnant woman, I think those things are critically important to continue doing right up until the point at which you go, uh, the, the mom goes into labor and comes to the hospital. As far as once that process begins, I think all pregnant moms should be encouraged to continue their prenatal care as they normally do, mm -hmm. to continue their, their birthing plans as they normally would, even in the time of, of COVID-19. We know that excellent prenatal care is associated with much improved um, uh, outcomes for the baby as well as for the mom. And despite the fact that we're living in this very uncertain time, uh, it's very important that all moms get the, the care that they need, especially during the, the laboring process. Uh, as far as what we're doing uh, and what our hospitals are doing, uh, much like uh, how we're caring for all of our COVID patients, the principle that we've used is separation, really trying to make sure that we're caring for our COVID-infected patients in a separate space, um, generally with separate healthcare workers, uh, so that there is very little chance of cross-contamination. So people who are caring for COVID-infected adults, COVID-infected children, and even COVID-infected moms and babies are not providing care, generally speaking, for uninfected people. And in addition, we've geographically separated these spaces where we're providing care. So on the medical units in our hospital, in the intensive care units in our hospitals, even in the labor and delivery and maternity areas in our hospitals. We've created separate spaces where moms uh, or patients or children who have a uh, novel coronavirus infection can be cared for safely away from people who are not infected. For those who, um, who are worried that they may be asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19, um, and, and again, we're going to have, I'm sure in the weeks to come, more conversations around antibodies and the testing that goes along with identifying those. If you are an asymptomatic carrier, will your body still develop antibodies to COVID-19? Well, I think... Uh, Based on what we know yeah, at this point in no, time. I, I think this is the immune reaction or the immune, how the immune system reacts uh, and responds to COVID-19 is probably 
one of the most critical questions that needs to be answered mm -hmm. and addressed in the, in the next several weeks to months. Uh, and there's a lot that's already being learned about that response. Uh, I think that we have seen in the literature that's published to date is that there's a, a heterogeneous response, meaning not everyone responds in exactly the same way. Okay. Uh, we do know that antibodies are generated against this virus, as most viruses will generate antibodies, uh, and that most antibodies start forming in your body somewhere between a week to two weeks after you're infected with the virus. Uh, but we do see differences. We see differences based on age. We see differences based on severity of illness. So people who are severely infected may develop a different type of antibody response and a different quantity of antibody compared to somebody who is mildly infected or even asymptomatically infected. And so you, we don't know yet how to characterize uh, people's immune immunity to this virus, and we don't know yet what that immunity really consists of. So we can detect uh, using different tests, different modalities, we can detect the presence of an antibody or antibodies to the virus in somebody who's recovered, mm -hmm. uh, but yet we don't know for sure if that provides protection, immune protection from uh, getting the virus again in a, at a later time. Uh, and we don't know really the lifespan exactly of what that, uh, if they are protected, we really don't know what the lifespan of that protection exactly is yet. We have a series of questions that I think are probably best described as sort of um, living with COVID-19 kind of questions, right? Your everyday life kind of stuff. Um, and I think there cannot be a person among us who has not experienced some of this over the last few weeks. So let's try to get to a couple of those um, now, if you will. Um, Alfred had a great question. Grocery shopping. I mean, what do you do? do you, should we leave groceries in the basement for a couple of days? Leave them, you know, you know, outside, not outside, but you know, if you bring them in, do you wash them? Do you spray them down with Lysol? Um, I mean, have you gone grocery shopping? What, what advice would you provide to people as they try to live their, as much of their everyday necessity lives as they can with everything going on? Yeah. So I think this, this question gets to how is the virus transmitted? How do we get COVID-19 or how do we get uh, novel coronavirus? And we're learning more about this every day. Uh, I think one way that is you know, readily apparent is that we can get it if someone's coughing near us or on us or sneezing near us or on us um, because it droplets from our mouth or from our nose can fly through the air and land on our nose, mouth, or eyes. Um, we can also get it by touching surfaces potentially. So if the virus is on a surface and we happen to touch that surface and touch our face or touch our mucous membranes, that's another entry, potential entry point for, for the virus. Uh, and then the third possible way that we can get it is by breathing in small respiratory droplets by somebody that's coughed or has been talking uh, or sneezing in a, at a distance from us. Uh, and there's evidence that the, the virus can be transmitted in, in any one of those ways. We don't really know which are the primary ways by which most people get infected, but we think that all three ways probably have some contribution to the number of cases that we're, that we're seeing. There's been uh, a growing body of evidence uh, that suggests that this virus behaves very similarly in a physical property sense to other novel coronaviruses like SARS, mm. uh, which means that it can be transmitted in the air or it can be found in the air uh, in patients who have been infected with this. So they, they may cough and expel droplets that contain this virus, and these droplets can settle on surfaces. And when scientists have looked at the, the surfaces when they've sort of done an experiment where they've put the virus on surfaces, what they've found is that the virus can be detected on those surfaces for some time, sometimes hours, sometimes even days mm -hmm. uh, after scientists will like, place it there. Uh, we don't know yet how that translates to somebody getting the infection. So we can't really say for from sure. From that surface. From that surface. Right. So, but what that means from a, from a daily sort of day-to-day -day kind of perspective uh, and guidance for folks when they're going shopping or they're going out to do other things is if you're touching surfaces or you're bringing in groceries, it may be the most important thing is really when you're done doing that, wash your hands and wash your hands very, very well like what you're supposed to do with 20 seconds. Um, if you can clean the surfaces before you handle them, that would be, uh, I don't see any downside to doing that. Uh, 
Um, again, if you have access to like bleach wipes and you can wipe down surfaces or wipe down the products that you're, you're bringing home with you is a very reasonable thing to do. Um, but, you know, not everyone may have that. Right. Uh, but I think if you're handling groceries or handling the mail, uh, you know, the things you want to do are avoid handling it and then touching your face. Uh, handle it, finish doing what you're doing, and when you're done, wash your hands very, very well, uh, and you should be uh, pretty safe. We talked about um, the, the three sort of main methods, or at least that we presume to be the three main methods of, of contracting this virus. We had a lot of folks who were concerned about um, maybe they live in an apartment building, uh, people in relatively close proximity, um, similar air ventilation systems that run throughout those facilities. Is there any information at this point that you're aware of that indicates the virus can be contracted through something like a ventilation system in an apartment building or, um, or you know, a similar type arrangement? I don't know that we have a, a lot of good evidence to suggest that that's possible. Uh, I think theoretically it's possible. I don't know that we have a lot of good evidence that we've seen any of that or experienced any of that as of yet. Uh, again, it's very difficult to know uh, at this point in time where any individual person uh, contracted uh, the virus. It, sometimes it's fairly easy to uh, ascertain. So for instance, if I'm living in a household with um, uh, my loved one or my spouse or another relative and that relative is sick and I get sick, well then it's you know fairly obvious where I might have gotten it. But uh, in other cases, it may not be so. So I, I don't know that we have good evidence for uh, airborne transmission within buildings through the ventilation systems of those buildings. And again, each building is constructed slightly differently. A different age of the building will impact how their ventilatory system is, is constructed. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a very difficult question to answer definitively. Yeah. I would say the, theoretically it's possible. It's probably uh, very unlikely and it's certainly not the main method of transmission. Um, but the, we don't know the answer to that question for sure. Uh, we are... I mean, it was one thing to self-isolate in the winter when there's snow and, and folks are homebound just because being outside is not pleasant. We're about to enter into a time period where everybody's going to want to be outside. Um, the weather will be appropriate for kids especially. Um, we talked a little bit about that, the, the, law, the thought process behind packages or mail or grocery shopping. Same line of thinking for playing outside, um, you know, playing with pets, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Either yours or the neighbor's pets or something along those lines. Should people be keeping that same type of philosophy, uh, do what you're doing and then wash your hands? What about those types of examples? I, I think absolutely. Uh, even in uh, the summer, which is rapidly approaching, fortunately, uh, I think the same recommendations will hold true, which is washing your hands, trying to maintain social distancing where appropriate. Um, we do think there may be some impact of warmer weather on this virus, and it's the transmissibility of this virus. I think that preliminary evidence suggests that there is a small impact that the warmer weather may have. Uh, the evidence that I've read suggests that once the temperature reaches 70 degrees or higher, the transmissibility of the virus does decrease uh, a mild to moderate amount, but I do not expect that we're going to just see the virus go away, so to speak, like we see the flu go away each uh, spring or summer. I, will ex I would expect that we will continue to see new cases uh, of COVID-19 uh, throughout the summer. Uh, and if people relax uh, on the social distancing and relax on the hand washing and relax on the other uh, mitigation strategies that we've put into place, we'll see much greater numbers of cases. Right, right. And we have time for just one last thought, and, and, and I think that's a, this is a nice opportunity to switch to it. Um, folks are going to start wondering when life goes back to normal, right? And, but, but pandemics and these types of infectious diseases don't have timetables. So um, what do you think are some things that people need to keep in mind as uh, folks, uh, political leaders, uh, business leaders, things like that, start to re talk about reopening the economy and, and getting folks back to work and, and back into society? What do you want people to remember about this time uh, when we do that? And, and what lessons maybe we've learned about what's important to think about um, in light of what we've done so far over the last yeah. few weeks? Oh, I think that there's a lot uh, of lessons to be learned uh, and, and a lot of messages that we need to internalize and take home. I think the most important one is that we need to ensure 
that we have the knowledge and know-how and facts at our disposal. We're not going to get through this uh, with conjecture. We're not going to get through this with rumor. We're not going to get through this with uh, somebody's best idea of what they think might work. We need science uh, and we need people who are trained in conducting science uh, to give us the answers that we need. They're not going to be right 100% of the time. Sometimes we can't replicate in experimental conditions exactly what's going on in the real world, but uh, with that information, we're going to have our best chance uh, to combat this virus and any epidemics that are coming down the road at us. And we can expect that this is not the last time we're going to be dealing with something like this. You know, if we just look at the last, uh, you know, since the turn of the century, we've dealt with SARS, we've dealt with MERS, we've dealt with Zika, we've dealt with countless other uh, mini epidemics, and we will deal with many others. Ebola, forgot, almost forgot Ebola. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we will be dealing with things of this nature for uh, some time to come. We can expect other outbreaks and other epidemics to, to come down the road, and we really need uh, the expertise uh, to figure out the best way to respond to each individual, because not each one is has its individual nuances uh, and individual strategies that will be effective. As far as what people can expect moving forward, I think that there will come a time that we can slowly reopen the country, we can slowly get our economy moving again, um, but this needs to be done very thoughtfully uh, and very carefully, and it probably won't be done all at once. I think it's going to, you're going to see that it's going to be done in bits and pieces here and there, uh, and it may not be all at once in one geographic location. It may be that you know, young people who've recovered for the illness might be the sort of the first ones out the door, so to speak, and you know, the folks who are most vulnerable, like our elderly population or our infirm population, may still need to practice the very aggressive social distancing um, uh, interventions that we've all been subjected to over the last several weeks. So I, I do think we're going to start to see a slow unraveling of some of the the interventions that we've all undertaken, but I would strongly urge folks that I, I would not expect, and I would be very surprised if we're not still practicing some of the um, uh, things that best we've practices. come, the best practices that we've come to learn uh, are helping to mitigate this virus months down the road. So I would expect, you know, some social distancing to still be in place even, you know, through the summer into the fall. You know, the recommendations about hand washing, the recommendations uh, about, uh, you know, all the other things that we need to do, group, large gatherings, Covering of faces. Things, cover your faces. I think all those things we're probably not going to be relaxing on uh, in the short term. A bit of a new normal. Dr. Correct. Kessler, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today. On behalf of uh, Dr. Jason Kessler, the Section Chief of Infectious Diseases at Atlantic Health Systems Morristown Medical Center, I'm Luke Margolis. Uh, please remember, folks, we have a series of these coming your way. Um, try to join us. We'll put um, Every week we'll put uh, an email out. We'll post this information on our Facebook page and, of course, on the homepage of our website, AtlanticHealth.org. Uh, all the information about upcoming series like this. The next one, if you enjoyed this conversation about somewhat of the clinical nature of COVID-19, you're going to want to join us for the next one, too. We have um, the Chief Medical and Academic Officer for Atlantic Health System, Dr. Jan Schwartzmiller, telling um, all of you a little bit about um, how we're caring for folks in the age of COVID-19. Uh, certainly a discussion you won't want to miss. Uh, thank you again for taking a few moments to stay with us today. Um, if you missed any part of this, um, check out the entire video on our uh, Facebook page. And team members for Atlantic Health, you can see it on Workplace as well. Thank you so much.